We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Don Durrett, author, investor, and contributor to Seeking Alpha and founder of goldstockdata.com. How are you today, Don? Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me back. Great to have you back. And of course, you know, the last time we spoke, you basically ended the interview by saying, check back with me in, in late June to see how really the, the economic environment is doing and how that's affecting metals prices. So has the last you know, quarter played out the way you had thought? Um, I was a little taken aback by how strong the dollar's been. Mm -hmm. um, that's been the biggest surprise. But yeah, so H2 starts, you know, starts now in July. So that's the reason why I always look in six months. I'm, I'm always kind of six months ahead. That's what I like to focus on but beyond six months. And it's really gets fuzzy. Um, but yeah, that, that it, the one thing that's really taken me by surprise has been the strength of the dollar. Also, the optimism on Wall Street. Um, that's another big one. I didn't think they would be as confident that the economy is just going to, is kind of just going to come back, if you will. And that, and that mindset is still there on wall street that all we have to do is be patient here. The kind of the worst is behind us or almost behind us. And we'll turn a corner economy will come back, you know, we'll get the risk on trade, but going again. So those, those are the, probably the two biggest factors, I think that have kind of surprised me. Mm -hmm. So let's say when we think about that optimism from from Wall Street, yet we're getting all this this economic data that seems very negative. What part of that data worries you the most? Well, um, well, from a gold investor standpoint, the, the, what worries me um, is the economy coming back. So the economy is kind of um, gold's kryptonite. If the economy is stable, um, you know, growing a little bit, it doesn't have to grow, even grow strongly. It just has to be growing, right? Uh, two percent, anything above two percent GDP is kind of really bad for gold. It's like I don't need gold. The only thing is, I I only care about high gold prices. I don't care. I don't invest for the short term. I want all time highs. Gold goes to 1900, 1950. All that does is get me a little excited about where we're, we're basically game on for a new all time high. But as far as my investments go, I don't get excited at all for, you know, short term or I mean, we're at 1740 today, but went up, you know, 150 bucks. That's a lot of money, right? That doesn't really get me super excited. I'm long term. I'm after big returns. My focus is $2,500, $3,000 gold. Mm -hmm. So I'm that so I'm way out there. I wanted to make that point. So so my fear is the, is the economic strength to prevent that from happening. The only thing, the only way I'm getting to twenty five hundred gold, um, then three thousand is if the, we got to have some really serious weakness in the economy. Mm -hmm. So I've been waiting for this serious weakness, and so you know you know it's a matter of the Fed. You know if they what they can pull that rabbit out of their hat, how, you know, how much magic does the Fed have to kind of bring this, bring this economy back, you know, back to growing at 2% plus. Mm -hmm. It's evident we're not at 2% growth now. And I don't think we're going to see that some, you know, may, some people say we probably will in Q4. We're not going to see it in Q3. That's pretty evident. We're, you know, we're in the first month of Q3 and it's, it's pretty weak. So maybe Q4, um, but I actually am very bullish for, say, uh, November, December for gold, because I think, you know, the bad news isn't all out on the economy and Wall Street will have to start um, rethinking, you know, what the economy is actually going to do in 2023, 2024. I think this is a, an epic moment for the United States. Um, and when I say epic, I'm really talking about kind of a transition away from its global dominance that it's maintained since, uh, say, 1945. Mm -hmm. We've seen some major banks come out and raise their gold price targets to two thousand five hundred by the end of the year. Do you do you think that that's reasonable, Don? And, and do you think that some of that economic data has informed why they think that gold is going to that by the end of the year? 
Um, you know, I, that, it's kind of shocking to me that their numbers are that high. I don't know. I don't expect to go to 2,500 this year. Um, not, I don't even expect to go to 2,200 this year. But I, I think that, for instance, you know, it's going to be Q4. We'll see how gold, you know, what it does. But we could actually go lower here in the in the short term. Mm -hmm. And the lower we go, I mean, if 1680 doesn't hold, you can forget about 2500. 1680 is a really important level. When we went down, I think I didn't see the actual intraday low 1715 somewhere around there, you know. But we were kind of getting in that 1680 territory, you know, uh, very recently. And so, you know, and so it's really important that these levels hold. You have, for me, the key here is 1680. So the reason why, you know, people that are watching, why 1680 is so important. So we've been in a, a 23 month correction with gold and silver. And it during this 23 months corrections, it started in August, 2020. Um, we actually went down and touched 1680 twice after going all the way up to almost 2100. Um, so that's a big drop, right? And we we touched it twice. So it went down and touched it and went in back and it, and it retested it. So I'm thinking that that's going to hold. And then 1850 on the silver side has massive support going all the way back to 2007, eight, I think. Um, and we have on 1850 uh, on the weekly, you have about 15 touches. On the daily on 1850, you probably have 100 touches. It's pretty amazing. So 1850 is huge support. I'm hoping it holds. It's really important. If, if it does, those levels do hold. Um, really, you have to start looking at, you know, what are the what are the numbers that are, you know, start to drive gold higher. So we got to get it back back above 1800. So anything below 1800 is kind of weakness. Um, for silver, we need to get above 20 above 22. So we're kind of in, you know, this bearish territory, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, brutal sell-offs in the miners, but the overall, um, this is a correction inside of a bull market. As long as we don't break down out of the channel, so the the, the channel has basically been created in both gold and silver um, going back to 2020, August 2020 is when the channel began. So we're still in a channel. As long as we stay in the channel, everything's fine. And we could, you know, we could rally here in Q4. Now we're not going to rally to 2,500. I, that's a real long shot, but we could get to above 2,000. For me, is I just want to be above 2,000 January 1st. We're above 2,000 January 1st, anywhere above 2,000 January 1st. I think 2023 is going to be a massive year. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. So it, basically this year is about surviving, basically buying the dip. Um, that's what I've been doing. You know, I always, you know, that's, I'm a long-term investor. So I always like to buy the dip. You generally make, you know, your most money, um, during bear market, big bear markets, and you basically buy stocks on sale. So, you know, this is kind of opportunity time. The only time you can really buy producers, quality producers on sale is during a big sell-off. But we could go, if 1680 doesn't hold, it could get really, really ugly quickly. Somebody asked me that today on Twitter. And, you know, how low can we go? And I say, basically, I said that you, once you, once, once you, uh, important support levels break out, things can get really wonky and you can go a lot lower than you think you're going to go. Mm -hmm. So, and it's hard to predict how, how far down. But um, for me right now, it's about let's see if these these important levels hold and let's see if we get above 2000 by January 1st. Mm -hmm. So do you think that this current trend of this grinding lower in the gold and silver prices and, and even the miners really continues until the, the Fed makes a shift in his current hawkish stance, whether that's even a pause or an actual reversal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a really good question, a really important question. So I mentioned, you know, I mentioned earlier that one of the things that surprised me was the strength of the dollar. So until the Fed at least pauses, you know, they got to they got to say something around pausing. Um, the dollar is going to stay strong here. Japan basically says we're not raising rates, right? And so Europe is going to start raising rates, but they're not going to be aggressive. Um, they're both. Uh, Japan, I don't know if they're hiding their inflation or how high it is, 
Um, but they just own, they started MMT, you know, way before us in the 1990s. So they're just, they just own so many bonds. They, they just, they just don't want to, they don't want to raise rates. Um, so that's the reason the dollar is so strong. But I, I think once the Fed, I think we all know that rates are going down, it's just a matter of when. And so when the rates go down and once they pause and then the, the markets will start expecting, you know, the pivot. I don't know if we'll get the pivot this year. There's a possibility we could get it, you know, in Q4. Um, I, I I actually think that they're 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 going to raise in September. September is, is the critical month, um, but it's the wording that they say when they pause. So they're they're going to raise absolutely. They're going to raise in July. We all know that 100. percent It's a matter of they do they raise 0.50 or 0.75. Um, I think the markets will really uh, want 0.5. Um, I think it's going to be 0.75, which is going to put more pressure on the on the markets, downward pressure on the on the stock market. Mm -hmm. And then then they're going to say, okay, what's going to happen in you know in September? I think they're going to raise 0.5 in September, and then basically start jawboning that that's probably it. We're probably going to pause. And then so basically you get the, the pause in September and then the pivot, um, you know, probably December, January is my expectation. Mm -hmm. They might go a little further. Um, this, they'll go as far as they can. It depends on how high inflation is. But I think the worst of inflation is behind us, except for, you know, it's still going to be nasty for consumers. For instance, food prices are probably going to continue going up. I don't see a lot of things going down. A lot of these commodity prices that are coming down, that doesn't really impact people per se. I don't think, I think we're going to still see, you know, higher prices and things that, you know, we need, if you will, you know, food, rent, you know, insurance, stuff like that, uh, services. I don't see, uh, you know, I don't, gasoline, for instance, is not going down this year. Um, so things we need, I don't see any real relief, if you will. So inflation, the consumers are going to be feeling a lot of inflationary pain all year. So that's going to be tough for the Fed to pivot and re reduce rates when all that pain's occurring. So that's the reason why I think they'll raise in September is because of the consumer pain. Um, and so uh, I think politically, I don't think they really have a choice here. Um, they have to fight inflation. I think that's really important for them to maintain their credibility, even though I think their, their DNA and their inclination is to support the economy, support the markets. I think that's their DNA. I mean, most of these guys are from Wall Street. Mm -hmm. uh, when you help, when you fight uh, inflation, you're helping the consumer. I, I don't think that's their DNA. So, but politically, they, they kind of have to help you know, the people from suffering, if you will, people that can't afford, you know, drive to work, basically, people are falling behind on, on bills because of inflation. So that that's going to be with us all year. So, but yeah, yeah, the Fed is critical here for gold and the economy. Um, so we, you know, once the dollar, um, so let's say, you know, we get these say 1680 or 1850 don't hold and we start crashing, crashing, crashing. At that point, you have to be kind of patient recognizing that the dollar um, is it at some point is going to come down. And when it comes down, the metals are going to come back, but it, it, it's, you know, it's going to be, it could be a really painful, difficult period, you know, paper losses, if you will. I mean, 2008, I mean, oh, my goodness, it was so bad. <laughs> Worse than, you know, I mean, I think I don't know how low the HEI got, but it was at 150 or less. I think it was less. Um, I think it might even went all the way down to 100 in 2008. So that, that's 100% down from here, 50% down from here. Um, that would be kind of the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if we, the HUI went to 170, that would be really, really ugly. Oh, man. You know, 150, 170 would be nasty. I mean, you're talking most stocks are down, you know, most juniors are going to be down 70% or more. We don't want to see that, but that, that that's still a possibility. But again, once the dollar starts dropping, I don't know how long it will take for the dollar, um, for gold to rally back and the HUI to rally back. But um, 
you know, it took almost three years, 2009, 2010, 2011, two and a half years it took to, you know, but it, it was a massive rally from, you know, March, April, May, 2009 to, I think it was July, August, 2011, just a massive rally. So that's kind of what I'm expecting here, kind of a similar scenario where you basically hit a bottom um, in miners and in the stocks, and then gold starts rallying. Um, but again, it's going to come down to that kryptonite, the economy. You know, what does the economy do in 2023? Does it, you know, does it come back to life? Um, are people going to be concerned? What's going to be the fear factor that pushes gold the way that it did from 2009 to 2011? What's that going to be? I think it's going to be the fallout of Ukraine, but I'm just guessing there. Um, the fallout of the new BRICS, for instance, and we're seeing this new economic uh, partnership evolving. You had the BRICS and they're calling it BRICS plus. You had Indonesia, which is a very big country join. You had Mexico join. Uh, you had Iran, which isn't that big. You had Argentina. Uh, then the, and then the next one who's ta talking about it is, is uh, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, Saudi, so Saudi Arabia joins this team, this group, and they, what are they going to trade in? What currency is this new economic? I mean, the whole purpose of this new economic union is to bypass SWIFT. So SWIFT is a dollar-based system. So this new system has to use a different currency than the dollar. What is it going to use? They think they're going to use a basket of currencies. That's That potentially is, that's the wild card for that I'm talking about where everything just starts kind of falling apart for the U.S., because basically the euro dollar starts kind of faltering because all this all this money, this foreign money, these countries that go brick plus are like, I don't need dollars. I don't need that. I don't need as many dollars I used to have. So they basically start dumping them. Um, so, you know, I'm, for me, uh, Asia is a really important uh, economic region. I, I just think that Asia... Uh, for instance, you know, China's not part of the G7. What's up with that? You know, it's the second largest economy and they're not in the G7. Um, that's kind of crazy, right? So the, China's not happy with that. They've never been invited. And so it's like, come on. And so they're they're pushing, they're basically trying to create a new economic system where they're a bigger player. They're, they're getting marginalized. Um, and so, and, and, you know, the U.S. has been playing hardball. You know, Trump kind of started the hardball, right? He started putting, um, you know, the tariffs on China. And Obama didn't have any tariffs on China. He was like, you know, he was like their friend. Um, Ian Clinton was their friend too. And I think Bush was also their friend. And so Bush Jr. So, you know, we've been friends with China, you know, since the 90s. And then Trump came in and said, okay, you guys are not playing fair, right? And he kind of, kind of just started, he basically said, you guys aren't our friends anymore. And here's your tariffs. And until you guys start playing fair, we're, we're not we're no longer nice, nice. And then Biden came in and, you know, it's kind of interesting. He basically adopted the same thing that Trump had. He didn't go back to the Obama doctrine of you know, dropping the tariffs and being nice, nice. So you have this, you know, basically this political economic war going on, Cold War with China. And China um, now is making nice, nice with, you know, with Russia and with India. And so, you know, what's going to happen here, you know, this global economic, uh, you know, competition between the East and the West, I, you know, it's going to be really interesting. I, I think it's a transition point and the U S dominance is going to fade a little bit. And once it starts to fade, how does it, you know, kind of maintain what it's been doing for the last 30 years, which is living off of debt. Can we continue to live off debt if we're no longer the global dominant player? You know, this is the one thing that Wall Street's kind of in denial about. They think that it, th th this isn't going to happen and we don't even have to worry about it. I think it's a serious issue. Mm -hmm. Could Russia inflict more pain to the West here as well? I, I know on Twitter you were pointing out an article that talked about them cutting their oil production, but wouldn't this hurt them as well? 
Um, yeah, Russia, you know, they really gambled here by invading Ukraine. Uh, you know, they ostracized themselves with the, with the West. They, they actually had, I think, I think it was a mistake, but, you know, it, it's going to take a long time for, for Russia to regain their, their stature, if you will, especially with the West, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they, they, you know, they game this out. And, and so far, you know, it looks like they have a lot of allies, which is, we, I don't think we anticipated. I think they guessed right about, you know, allies with, for instance, China and a lot of these third world countries, you know, um, you know, the UN was a really good, good eye opener, right? All these third world countries basically didn't want to, you know, join in on the sanctions against Russia and ostracize them. So, you know, it's going to take a while. One thing that Russia had, I thought, had going for it was this relationship with Europe. Right. They, basically a perfect partner for all their energy, oil and gas. They had a good situation. Plus, they have a lot of food and fertilizer. They had a great relationship with with Europe. I, I, I thought that was totally in their interest to to basically just keep expanding that. But Putin, he basically he got really paranoid that the NATO was a threat. He thought NATO is a threat. I cannot allow them to be on my border with Ukraine. I, Ukraine has to be my, Ukraine is mine. It's my ally. I cannot allow this. It's a red line you cannot cross. So he basically weighed. Okay, I got my my, you know, my relationship with Europe, which is really strong right now. And you know, do I destroy that or really upset it and uh, protect myself from NATO? Which one? Well, which way do I go? And he. He decided that, you know, I'm sure they game this all out and, and, and decided that it was going to be a net win for them. And it's really interesting. I mean, Putin has said that, which is kind of really strange stuff, because this is really isn't being spoken about in, in, the, um, in the U.S. media. But Putin is saying that this invasion of Ukraine is going to impact the U.S.'s global dominance. Right. Have you heard that? No, I haven't. Oh, he said it many times. He basically said it this week. He said that the U.S. is underestimating that th how much this is going to impact them, their global dominance. I forget exactly his actual words, but he said it again this week. He said it several. He said it several times that the overall fallout of all of this, because he he blames the U.S. and he blames NATO, but he's you know the U.S. is basically the leader of NATO. He blames NATO for for this whole Ukrainian in, invasion um, because he said it was, you know, basically a red line. He's, he's same thing. If they went into you know Mexico, we, we would be a red line for us kind of situation. Um, but it's it's going to be interesting to see how the dollar and the global, uh, you know, you know, how, how everything unfolds internationally, politically. I mean, he, he, you know, one thing I learned really early, you know, in college was that I had a friend who was an international relations major. And he told me, he said that international relations is always about business and money. Mm -hmm. It's not about security. And, you know, he's he's been, he, I think he's right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> It, it, the U.S. has like 300 or something um, military bases globally. But you, but are really, I mean, who's really a threat to the U.S.? Who's going to attack the U.S.? You know, we have we have we have an incredible military defense. Right. Why are we being why do we need 300 bases to defend the United States? Right. That makes absolutely zero sense. Now, are we trying to do that to create global peace? Well, that's obviously not true. Right. Because whenever there's a war that breaks out that isn't, you know, we don't care about like Saudi Arabia basically has been at war at Yemen and basically destroying that country. And we're like, oh, good, whatever you want to do. It's not part. It's not our, you know, it's not in our interest. Whatever you want to do, Saudi Arabia, we're not coming to the defense of them. Right. That's crazy stuff, right? That's like not even in the mainstream media. And that war has been going on for what, two years now? Mm -hmm. um, and all the wars in Africa, we kind of ignore them. You know, it's, it, 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 it's when it's in our business interest that we get involved, right? So, it, so you have to think about these things. Um, notice that all of our uh, political 
foreign policy is never transparent. They always they don't tell us what they're doing. They never they never do. Remember, you know, kind of all these wars, you know, why did we go into you know Iraq twice? Why did we go into Afghanistan? Why are we going to Syria? They never really tell us why is so important. Weapons of mass destruction? Yeah, right. I don't, you know, who 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 bought that? They knew it wasn't true. That was a pretext, right? Mm -hmm. We have to go in there because they have weapons of mass destruction. It's it's some, you know, there's no transparency. So it's really difficult for people to connect the dots around uh, economics and security and you know what is you know and then you know it's 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 pretty fascinating but i, I you can't really separate them so you have you have to connect the dots and it's you know it's kind of like nutrition you kind of have to learn it on your own no one's going to really teach you i mean mm -hmm. You know, you know, you know you, you, the, the, the television, the boob tube is not going to tell you about nutrition. <laughs> well, Don, you know, you and I had a, a bit of a conversation before we hit record here today about how you think the the political system is really, in some ways, you could say two sides of the same coin. So how does that broken political system really incentivize, in some ways, more destruction of the U.S. dominance in the world? Right. So we don't we don't want to put people to sleep on politics. We want to talk about golden economics. I'm, I kind of got off track a little bit there, but I, but I will make this one point is our political system is connected to economics and our political system is broken. I think it's pretty evident. Right. We, we kind of have an all or nothing type of political system today. It's either the Democrats control everything or the Republicans control everything or else we, they or else they fight each other. Right. There's no middle ground today, which is which is very um, disconcerting for the U.S.'s political, I mean, economic strength. Right. Because if you don't have any type of political cohesion or political strength, you're going to have economic weakness, economic disarray, which is kind of what we have today. So they're very linked. And I think it's it's very disconcerting um, as an American, as you know, what's our future for the rest of this decade? If our political system is, is going to fragment more and our political system is going to get worse, what does that say about our economic system? Plus, our debt levels are exploding. You know, now we, we basically adopted MMT. MMT is basically the economic philosophy that debt doesn't matter because we have a printing press and we can always print our interest. We can print whatever we owe. But that's 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 an assumption. And I think it's a false assumption that basically the printing press is always going to work. It might not always work. And I, I say that it's not going to work. At a certain point, you're not going to be able to print at will. So everybody says, you know, for instance, our bonds, I've always said that, you know, the Achilles heel of the U.S. is its bonds, is its debt. And we're already, we're already seeing it right now. And I predicted this many years ago, a decade ago, that the Fed would have to monetize the debt, mm -hmm. which we're seeing now in spades, right? The Fed is monetizing the debt. So they said they were going to go into QT in July and they were going to stop buying these bonds and they were going to stop buying the mortgage-backed securities. Well, let's just keep an eye on their the only thing that matters, which is their balance sheet. Let's see if it shrinks. If it doesn't shrink, that means they're buying more stuff, right? They're printing and buying more stuff. And I, I submit that their balance sheet is going to grow. It's not going to shrink um, the rest of this year. It's at nine. Let's see where it is at the end of the year. I'll be shocked if it's at eight, five. Absolutely shocked, mm -hmm. right? So the QT is, you know, that just means they're slowing down because of fighting inflation. They're slowing down, but they but they still have to buy um, some. They can't just stop because if they stop, who else is going to buy? Who else is going to monetize these bonds, right? So if if you if you get to the point at a certain point, everything breaks, and and that's what nobody really looks at is wow, we're kind of close to that breaking point. At what point? How much? If the Fed monetizes, say 60, 70, 80 percent of the debt, you know, at what point does everything break? You know, I, I, there's, you know, there's curtain, I always look at, you know, certain data points that are important, right? Like my support levels for gold and silver. Um, you know, the HUI at 250 for me is kind of a positive negative kind of thing. I, I look at, you know, certain numbers. So the interest rate on the 10 year for me, three and a half percent is kind of borderline. 4% in the US is bankrupt. 
We cannot go to 4%. And isn't it interesting that the Fed basically, they know this. They said that they're going to go to three and a half because they know we can't go to four. We're bankrupt at four. But three and a half is like a big red light. Yellow is like 3.3. Maybe maybe orange is 3.3 and yellow is 3.2, you know, somewhere in there. You know, we're probably okay to 3.2, but once you get about 3.2, 3.3, once you get to 3.5, you could say that three, five is orange, and then four is red, if you want to do it that way, and yellow is like three, three to three, five. But we cannot afford high interest rates in this country. Japan can't either, and ECB can't either, because they basically all adopted MMT, where they said debt doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, and at a certain interest rate, you're bankrupt. And I think of this decade, I expect the US to, to default on a portion of their debt. A hair, we're going to take a haircut, not 100%. We're not going to default on all of it. But we're basically going to say we can't monetize all this debt. That's my expectation. It's a theory. I could be full of it. You know, the US economy could come back to life here and gold could go down to 1500. I mean, this is all possibilities. But um, that's a, a really important uh, number. Uh, but so the deficit's like one trillion dollars a year plus one trillion, and we basically now we kind of ignore it. Um, one trillion is nothing, right? One trillion today, a one trillion deficit today is nothing. We mm-hmm. we we don't even care. It's irrelevant. Kind right? of like kind of like the debt ceiling. It yeah, just keeps yeah, getting right. raised. Yeah, one trillion dollar annual deficit is nothing. Well, that's about a hundred billion dollars a month that that has to be monetized. Mm-hmm. Someone's got to buy that money. So that's at 40%, that's you know, 40 billion a month that the Fed has to print, starts adding up, their balance sheet starts growing. And I would think they're kind of monetizing probably around 30 to 40% right now, maybe higher. I'm guessing again, but they are monetizing a chunk of that deficit. And we go into recession and suddenly the deficit is going to go to 1.5 plus, right? That's serious money. And if we don't climb out of the recession at, at a quick pace, let's say we stay in a recession or zero growth and we go into, we turn Japanese. Remember Japan, when their economy stopped growing in 1990, they started printing money, but what happened? They had no growth. Mm-hmm. They haven't had growth in 30 years, but if throughout the nineties, they, they basically, went up and down from plus 1% to minus 1%, up and down, you know, they basically hovered right around zero. And they're printing money like crazy trying to stimulate. Well, that's what, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to stimulate the Fed's balance sheet. Well, if, if, if we can't get any growth, again, my theory, if we can't get any growth and the Fed keeps trying to inject money, their balance sheet is going to grow. Our deficits are going to get bigger. Our debt bubble is going to get bigger. Well, what does that mean? Fear and uncertainty is going to increase. And at a certain point, you can't keep gold down. But this is all about uncertainty. And this is all about systemic risk. At a certain point, systemic risk raises its head. I mentioned 3.5% on the 10-year. That's That creates systemic risk. Because everybody knows at that level, the U.S. can't really afford it, can't afford those kind of debt payments. You can't have trillion dollar interest payments. This year, I think it's going to be about $600 billion. I keep throwing numbers out that I'm probably off. Um, but this year, our interest payments are going to be pretty darn high. Um, and they're rolling over a lot of this debt. Every time they roll it over, they got to you know, borrow at 2% or more. Um, you know, the two, you know, the two year right now is what, two and a half percent. So that's about as cheap as they can really, you know, borrow. So it's getting dicey out there. So we'll see what happens. Don, is it possible, you know, could it be that those debt payments getting to $1 trillion a year, is it possible that that maybe becomes the catalyst where Wall Street starts to lose confidence in the Fed and that leads to this fear trade into gold that we spoke about last time? Um, yeah, yeah, that's going to be part of it. I think it's going to be a, a confluence of events. Um, one of them is the leverage. So you, you you talked about, yeah, the, the, the Fed just keep expanding their balance sheet, you know, monetizing their debt. But then you have corporate debt, which is really high, and you have consumer debt, household debt. Mm-hmm. So you have a lot of leverage in the system already. Right now, we're seeing you know people are using their credit cards and they're tapping out 
you know, they're starting to really get high here. Um, I've been reading about used cars, about a lot of uh, delinquent payments on used cars because they're getting so high, right? People are buying these used cars with these high payments and they can't afford it. So it's a confluence. You just start to see things start to kind of break down and then you can't grow. And then once you can't grow, it kind of is kind of snowballs. And, and, you know, and, you know, that's kind of what I'm looking at where I call it muddling. It's kind of like turning Japanese where you muddle, where you can't grow. And so you're basically at flat, you, you know, forget about 2% growth. You're like, okay, here comes the GDP numbers. What's it going to be 0.25 positive or 0.25 negative, right? It's just flat as a pancake, basically, mm-hmm. you know, and the jobs numbers, I think are going to get a lot weaker. Um, yeah, we can talk a little about the jobs numbers today. They were weird, right? You had the government numbers were, they said were really, really strong, uh, over 300,000 jobs added. Then the household survey was the exact opposite. The household survey was minus 300,000. So what and they're now, they're normally pretty darn in sync. How did, how did this get so out of sync? Well, you know, put your, you know, your tenfold hat on, right? Which one do you believe? <laughs> I tend to believe the household survey number, right? Well, we can, uh, we can always revise it lower, right? <laughs> so, so basically it's, I think that uh, the job market is weaker than that, that, that job number today, the, the, the 300, actually it was 372,000 added. Um, and the household survey was minus 315. So, you know, if it's probably, you know, it's not much above, you know, zero. I, I don't think we have a lot of growth here. Um, plus, the economy is not strong right now. So is it really going to just come back to life if the Fed isn't pumping it? And the Fed's not going to pump it this year. I don't see how it can. Mm-hmm. So the jobs are is probably going to get weaker. And then at a certain point, um, and I've always said this, is, is the COVID damage to the economy, um, that doesn't just go away. There's been a lot of damage to the economy from COVID. That, that has to be rebuilt. And if it doesn't, for instance, the participa- participation rate is supposed to be around 63 or higher. It's down to 62.2. So a full percentage point down, you know, almost a full percentage down from after COVID. So all those workers, you know, you know haven't went back to work. And that, that's, that's a big impact on the economy. And, and so we got that going on right now. We have a low participation rate now, and we're heading into a recession. So we're probably going to go sub 62 on participation rate. That's not that's not good. And then how do we climb out of that hole? You know, the Fed probably how many trillions does the Fed have to print to try to generate growth? And I talked about how Japan tried to do this in the 90s. They tried, but they couldn't. It didn't matter how much money they printed. They couldn't get the economy to grow. Look at the overnight loans for the banks. It, last time I looked, it was two point two point three trillion dollars. Those are the overnight loans that the banks are giving to the Fed and getting paid, I think it's $250 million a day, which is $90 billion a year. They're basically just parking their money with the Fed overnight and just rolling it over and getting paid money. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that happening? There's there's only one, there's one answer, right? The banks don't want to loan it out. They don't want to loan it out because they're afraid they're not going to get paid back. They're afraid to make any loans. That's all been through COVID. And now, you know, at what point does the banks decide they're going to make loans? Well, do you really think it's going to happen this year? Probably not. So you're rolling over to 2023. Remember, I only like to go out six months. So we have to come back here and look where we're at in December and January. You can have me back uh, one of those months, (laughs) middle of December, middle of early January. Um, and we can look and see exactly what's unfolded, the str- you know, how we're looking going into 2023. But um, I don't I don't think I don't see this economy coming back to life. I don't see the participation rate going back to 63 anytime soon. 
Um, I think there's all this leverage in the, in the markets. The U.S. basically uh, living off of the, the ability to, to borrow money from the global uh, reserve. I think that that is um, a game that's uh, about to about to end, if you will. And once it ends, um, it, it's it's going to be very good for gold. That's why I have these targets of twenty five three thousand for for uh, gold and 75, 100 for silver with, a, with kind of an expectation that silver will probably over, because of shortages will probably overshoot and potentially get to 150. Don, you know, as we're talking about the destruction in the economy due to COVID, I, I wanna get your thoughts on the supply style side of inflation. Do you think that we will see even more dramatic inflation numbers as soon as the Fed pivots and demand picks back up? Or, or is there going to be more kind of permanent demand destruction to the economy because of business and job losses? Yeah, I'm I, I'm not in the camp that the economy is going to crash because I, and which would be demand destruction, be, because of MMT and because of technology, I just see muddling. I, I see a lot of, I see a lot of liquidity, a lot of flooding money into the system. But simultaneous to that, if the banks aren't loaning money and you, and you don't have any velocity, the velocity of money is kind of stopped. And, and basically a lot of this money printing um, doesn't really make it out to the consumer per se. The consumer doesn't have the money. I mean, you know, they can do helicopter money. If they do helicopter money, then inflation can go really high. But I don't, I don't expect hyperinflation because I don't think they'll do helicopter money. I could be wrong. But if they do helicopter money, then yeah, you could, you could get hyperinflation. You could get 25% inflation. But I, I don't even think we'll get to, we're probably at 10. You know, they say we're at eight. We're probably at 10 or 12, but it depends on the person, depends on what you spend your money on. You know, I think the middle class and below middle class and lower class, I think I think inflation hits them harder because we get inflation on things you need, you know, food and rent and gasoline, energy, utility bills. Those are all up high. Right. So your inflation is above 10 percent. But it depends on the percentage of your, you know, your income, your spending on that per se. So it depends on, you know, who you individuals on how much inflation that they get. But and I think that inflation for those people is going to stay kind of burdensome um, for quite a while. It's not going to go away this year and we'll have to wait and see where we're at. But I'm not expecting, you know, this hyperinflation where I, I, don't, I don't know if people think 20, 25 percent is hyper. I don't think we're going to 20 percent inflation um, across the board. I don't even think we're going to 15. But if we stay anywhere above five, it's nasty. I mean, five percent compounded is kind of ugly. You know, you're burning a hole in your pocket if you're holding dollars above 5%, especially above 10%. 10% compounded, that's pretty nasty if you're holding dollars. You know, your savings is getting butchered. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking, uh, you know, inflation is probably going to be around 5%, um, say, you know, the middle of next year, and then it kind of... I don't know. I, I don't see it taking off, but I see it kind of you know lingering for quite a while because the Fed is going to continue to inject money. Um, it's hard to again. It's hard to predict out more than six months what's going to happen. But I, you know, as of now, I'm I'm thinking like you know five percent inflation in 2023. Anything above that will be really ugly. Uh, below that, um, you know. But Japan had zero inflation. They were fighting deflation during their their 90s and they couldn't generate growth. So um, in, inflation, I, I don't think it's going to be good for the economy, really. Any 5% or above the U.S. economy, um, I don't think it's going to be positive because if you're at 5% inflation, that is painful for instance, you know, rents, if rents are going up 5% a year, um, most people don't get 5% raises. So, you know, once you get to 5% and above, it, it, it can get really difficult. And so that's going to hamper the consumer. So I see the consumers being hampered next year, uh, definitely going into the first quarter. You know, do, do things really get better in second and third quarter 2023? Um Maybe, but it's 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 too hard to predict at this time. But 
for me, it, it, it really comes down to um, our belief that, you know, that debt, we, that we can use debt to basically manage our economy and generate wealth, generate growth. I've always, you know, I go all, go all the way back to the Reagan era. And I always thought that what Reagan was doing by having these large deficits during a time of economic growth was insanity. Uh, George Booth calls it voodoo economics. I think it was voodoo economics and we never gave it up. And now we're at one trillion a year and we're not even, you know, we don't care. So we're like, you know, uh, we think that debt is the way to go, but I think that it's very dangerous and it's going to impact, eventually push gold up. Don, I got a, an email recently from a listener and he was making the point that while we're seeing, let's say, sub $18 silver levels, for example. Let's just use that example for this thought experiment here. Is it possible that some of these silver producers end up shutting down their production and delivering their existing contracts, let's say, out of the COMEX and draining that supply instead of mining, not necessarily at a loss, but you know, at these, at these razor-thin margins if they are close to that? Um, yeah, I... I, I get this question a lot on Twitter, you know, what's going to happen to the silver miners as, as it goes down. So let me start with the gold miners. So the gold miners there uh, as a sector, they're still, they'll be healthy all the way down to like $1,500 gold. So they have like 300, uh, 200 and a little over $200 of margin right now. Mm -hmm. So the gold miners are in much better shape as far as margin goes, as far as, you know, the sector, um, you know, having free cash flow, if you will. The silver miners, they're actually in trouble at sub 20. It's, so now it's going to be a matter of how long we stay under 20. Um, so, yeah. So I think that if you stay below sub 20 for, I think we could make it last about six months. I don't think you're going to see very many silver mines get shut in in the next six months. Some, it depends. There's some that are, you know, there's a, there's quite a few silver mines actually that have kind of a break even at 25. So <laughs> there's quite a few. So 20 for me, $22 is kind of like a, that's where the margin of safety. So for me, $1,500 gold and $22 silver are kind of similar areas. So you need to be around 22 to kind of have breathing room, if you will. Um, 25 is really kind of an ideal. So 25 would be the equivalent of 1800. So now we're under 20. So there's a lot of mines right now that are kind of losing money a lot. So, but they don't just shut them down instantly. They, they, they're patient, right? So it's gonna be, you know, in six months, are we still under 20? If we're still under 20 in six months, absolutely. You're gonna see some silver miners, some silver mines shut in, go in care and maintenance. Um, and, the, and the lower you get, you know, once you get below 18 and below 17, it gets really nasty because there are not a lot of silver mines out there that have break even costs below 17. Um, so we're, we're right. We're right, kind of right on the edge right now of kind of some wonky prices where you're kind of below cost, below, below break even. Um, but uh, a lot of these companies have decent balance sheets. The only time you really get in a super in a big trouble when you get these wonky prices is your balance sheet cannot get you through a year. But if you if you have you know enough cash where you can lose money for four quarters, you know you're gonna go you're gonna go ahead and keep that mine running. So it depends on your balance sheet. So you want to look at the balance sheet. There isn't really well. First of all, there's not a lot of silver miners. Uh, pure silver miners out there anymore. They've all basically went gold and silver. Um, so you can look, you know, you get really about 20 silver miners. I mean, that's about it, pure silver miners. Um, and most of those don't have, you know, really terrible balance sheets. You know, um, Arcana is, is by far the worst. They probably, they're in big trouble. They, they, they picked a the wrong time to have a problem. I don't know how they can, you know, get out of this one. It's they're in a they're in a pickle. 
But other than Arcana, Silver Bear has got a, a monster debt. I don't know how they, <laughs> but if they haven't went bankrupt yet, <laughs> I don't, I mean, they have, Silver Bear's got like $178 billion in debt. That's a million, million, 178 million. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot of debt for a company with no, no free cash flow. Mm-hmm. But they owe it all to themselves. The two largest shareholders own 90% of the company. So they owe it to themselves. So they basically just wait, 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 wait. Mm-hmm. They don't want to do the write-off because they think it's going to turn around. But that that those two, those two are, I can't think of a third one off the top of my head where you have a silver miner with a balance sheet problem that might not make it through six months. But those two, those two might not make it through six months of low of silver below 20. But yeah, you want to get back over 22 and you want to get back over 25. Those are important numbers. So Don, you know, going back to the second part of that question, if they have contracts that they have to deliver to, could we see them start to clean out the inventory in the COMEX to fulfill those contracts? Is that a possibility? Uh, I, 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 on the margin, I, I don't think it'll have an impact because you're only talking about one or two miners, right? It's, okay. it's, it's not, it's not, it's not enough to, to create an issue. The one thing about the comics, the Comex for me, I, you know, I've been watching that thing for a long time and it's just not transparent. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, so it's really difficult to analyze, analyze it and, and think, you know, what's going to happen as far as inventory, you know, you know, you know, the registered levels, you know, they, they, they just move them around. They move the, the, move the ounces around, you know, magically. It's like, so for me, I don't focus on the comics anymore. I've, I've, I, I did, I, I tried to see if it had, if I could see any correlation there, mm-hmm. I couldn't. So for me, the most important thing is inventory, not their inventory, but wholesale inventory. So it's, it's so, how many thousand ounce bars other than the Comex are available in, in the wholesale marketplace for to buy, if you will. And so for me, Andy Sheckman, Miles Franklin is probably the best source. If you want to understand the kind of the health of the inventory of the silver market, Sheckman, because that guy, he, he sells a lot of silver and he's, he knows all the big wholesalers. He knows the inventory levels probably the only guy out there that I know, I mean, that really understands it really, really well, because he's been doing it since, you know, 20 years plus. Uh, he, and he knows all the players and he talks to them. And so, and, and so it's the wholesale market. So if the wholesale market runs out of thousand ounce bars, you could have a shortage. And I, it's my feeling, um, the shortage will not start in the comics. It'll start at the wholesale level where you can't, the, the fabricators, they won't be able, they don't buy their silver on the comics. That's for all traders. They buy their silver through the, the wholesale market. Mm-hmm. And so once the wholesale market dries up, that's when you're going to see silver explode in value. And I'm expecting that to happen between $35 silver and 50 silver. Somewhere in there, the wholesale market will freeze up or you, we don't have any, we're out. We don't have any thousand ounce bars. There's none to be had. And when that happens, the remember 80% of silver, well, probably 70% of silver production goes from the mines to the industrial fabricators. 70%, it's a lot. So if they if there isn't any, you can imagine what's going to happen. All of your major manufacturers of electronics, of vehicles, of solar panels, all of them. They're constant. Most of them use just-in-time inventory. They don't have these huge inventories. You know, they might have three months inventory at the most, something like that. They can't find it. it, it once you get um, basically an article, the Apple shut down their line because they can't find any silver for their phones. Um, you know, Toyota shut down their plant because they can't find enough silver for their cars. Something, you know, something like this. Once you see a couple articles like that, it'll snowball. And, you know, it happened in Palladium. Palladium went from $100 to $1,000 fairly quickly because there wasn't any Palladium. Um, so you could see the same type of shortage in silver because there's not enough 1,000-ounce enough bars. So I don't care too much about what's going on in the comics. 
I'm more, I want to hear what Andy has to say about how easy, it, how easy it is for him to get a thousand ounce bar. Can he, you know, does it take him three months to get one? Taking, if it's taking him three months to get a bar, the inventory is really low. Um, and so that's, keep an eye on that. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that insight, Don. Do you think there's anything else worth touching on before we wrap up here? Let's see. What did we miss? Look down. Look down. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention one thing because uh, the people are wondering, you know, what do I do? You know, people that are holding miners, for instance, mm-hmm. um, you know, do I just, you know, they have their own investment strategy, of course, but I, I, I I just, you know, you know, are we at a bottom? Are we not? What do we do? So for the conservative investor, the smartest thing to do is to wait for the next run, the next breakout. So you just kind of just sit tight and wait, or you could go to cash and wait. Those are kind of the two um, op strategies. So what are you waiting for? What is the breakout? What's the next run? For me, it's pretty obvious. You want to wait until 2050 gold. So once it gets to 1900, your ears can perk up. Once it gets to 1950, you can start watching it every day or every hour. (laughs) Once it gets over 2000, you can start dancing around the room. And then once it gets to 2050, it's the green light. We're gone. But hold it. There's more. Once it gets to 2050, you can't break out the champagne. Sorry. All 2050 means is, is we got the, we got the, we got the phase, we got the stage one, if you will, Mm -hmm. we need something else to happen. And and this is where um, the last kind of breakout um, breakouts have been false breakouts because you didn't get a, you need a double confirmation. So what's the secondary confirmation? The secondary confirmation is silver closing above 30. That's your green light. So you so, so so we'll follow gold up to 2050. Once it gets to 2050, then our eyeballs go over to silver. Once silver gets to 30, then it's go time. $30 silver and 2050 gold, that's your breakout, your champagne. Now, it doesn't mean 100% sure that it's gonna, we're gonna get all-time highs in both of those. But the the, the chances of getting a significant run are very, very good because of the technical charts. The technical charts are gonna look beautiful, beautiful at that, at that level. So you should, we should get a massive run. So, so what am I telling you? People that are super conservative, just wait for that to happen because the runs could be just unbelievable. I mean, we're talking about a run from silver from 30 to 65. So if that happens, you can imagine what the miners are gonna do. So why, 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 why do I need to get in early? I can just wait for it, right? So the conservative player is just gonna wait, wait, wait. Now, the more, the very, the very um, the super conservative is gonna be in cash until that happens. You know, the more aggressive you're gonna hold and then basically add to your positions possibly, or just wait. Um, then kind of a more aggressive player would be buying this, buying the dip to the bottom. So this is me. I'm the more aggressive. I'm basically going to buy gold and silver stocks to the bottom. So um, we just saw we're about 215 in the HUI. I don't think we're going to 170. So I'll basically buy the HUI from 215 to however however low it goes. Buy to the bottom. That's the aggressive way, right? Now, the other aggressive way to to play this is to have an expectation that for instance, silver is going to confirm and then have an expectation that once gold gets to a certain level, it's kind of, it's going to keep going. So once gold gets to say 1900, you have to pick your poison kind of thing when when you're going to jump in. Do you jump in at 1850, 1870, 1900, 1925, 1950? You have to pick, you know, at what point do you think, okay, it's going to keep going, you know? Or do you wait all the way to 2050? So these are the levels you want to watch. So it's basically buy to the bottom and when you when you break out. But my, my I'm a long-term investor. I'm all about um, all-time highs and once in a generation run. And this is all based on the economy. If the economy doesn't get weaker, 
the economy goes back to 2% growth, I'm going to lose money. I'm speculating. I'm speculating that the economy is going to weaken. Gold's going to run. It's a speculation bet. All, all gold and silver miners are speculating bets. I mean, you have huge risk um, on anything that can go wrong with the mine, but then you have huge risk on the gold and silver price. You, when you put those two together, you're, you're a speculator. It's the bottom line. You're speculating. This is not, you know, people that are investing in, you know, majors thinking they're strong and I'm going to make 10% of my money. You're still speculating. I don't care how strong the company. You got Agnico Eagle, which is probably one of the strongest majors paying a good dividend. You're still speculating. That stock could still go down 10% tomorrow, 20% in two days, 30% in three. I don't care how strong it is. It could still go down 30% in three days. Yeah. I mean, it's sound advice and it's, I think a, an emotional reaction to air coming out of that bubble. And, and despite the safety play of gold and silver, it can still get drawn down like that. Right. Doc? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, one final point and then we'll go um, is people think that you hold gold for inflation and people are going, how come gold isn't going up with all this high inflation? And I have always said, um, it's it, inflation is really not the key driver for gold. It's systemic risk. Systemic risk is the is the main driver. And when you have systemic risk, every single time gold goes up. And so, you know, inflation, gold will do somewhat okay, you know, as a kind of a hedge, somewhat okay, but it's not going to rock it. You know, it's not going to just jump up in value just because you have high inflation because so few people own it and people aren't going to run to gold. That's just not an asset people like to run to. It's always going to be on the margin. You're never going to have 5% of the investors in gold. It's just not going to happen. All right, Tom, thanks for having me on. Good talk. Thanks, Don. That was very much appreciated. Of course, your website is goldstockdata.com, as, as we can see on your background. And you're a, a good follow on Twitter as well, at Don Durrett, two R's, two T's, right? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for throwing in the Twitter. I'm on there every day. That's Excellent. where I you know, educate people. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time today, Don. Appreciate it, Tom. Enjoyed it. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.